Excuse me, miss. Are you in Allison A? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Surely. What do you think of the liberal arts education here? What do I think of it? You mean in terms of whether it's good or not or what it provides? Well, first of all, what does it provide for you here as a student? Well, I think it gives um, me a good general background and so it'll make it easier to decide what I want to major in. Because I take a variety of courses and find out about different things. Okay, and what do you think the purpose of a liberal arts education is? I think that's the purpose, so that um, people can experiment with different subjects and maybe find out what they're truly interested in. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. The value of a liberal arts education would be that um, you have the opportunity to learn about other cultures, that you get a variety of experiences instead of narrowing your viewpoints. And to get an education, just that. I'm starting out in economics and just want an education. I'm not looking for a job, really. But I think I'll find one. There is no value. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm an engineering student. It's made me more aware of different things. Like if I would have just stayed in science or something like that, just all you know what was happening was in the world of biology and stuff, and now I feel like I know a little bit more about what's happening around me and I understand a little bit better. Uh, if you use it right, you come out a more whole person. <laughs> yeah, 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 all right. Thank you very much. Education, I guess, especially at a college level, is what you want to make out of it. My idea of what a liberal arts education is is just to give you a better idea of what's going on around you, whether it's in the area of the sciences or, or in the humanities, whether it's in politics or sociology, so that you have a better understanding of why the people around you behave the way they do or why you know, things behave the way they do, and how, if you have a better understanding of them, how you can better cope with them. Knowledge or whatever comes in many different forms. And um, one of the benefits of taking, let's say, a math and science course is, is at least you know exactly when you're wrong. If you've made a calculation error or you've given the wrong formula or something, that's pretty clear cut. Whereas in the middle of a discussion, although you're, let's say, in a humanities course, you're allowed more interpretation, um, you sometimes are not quite sure if you're right. So there's a lot of prerequisites before you go into all your math, science, and, and poli-sci courses and, and humanities courses for my major. Mm -hmm. So um, I found that it was really helpful and it's really necessary and really a lot of fun to just dabble in the liberal arts because uh, it gives you a background for eventually what you want to get to or at least following up your interests. It gives you a more solid foundation. Definitely. I definitely think undergraduate education should be holistic. You know, you should like have a, a wide perspective of things. Like, I think education used to be more like that maybe even with the classical kind of education where you have uh, a lot of everything and it's becoming so specialized with the uh, kinds of departments in education, you know, where people go through um, business training or something and, and pick up so minimal uh, liberal arts view of things or uh, and, then, and not be able to, to communicate, not be able to write, you know, that's the most obvious example of an over-specialized university and educational system. A lot of people end up being overqualified for a job, and I fear that's what's going to happen to me. My, my dad still says, uh, take some math courses, go to business school, become a tax lawyer. He always wanted me to be a tax lawyer, because my uncle Dean, who is financially well off, became a tax lawyer. That's his brother. Okay. Um, but I don't like that. My mother always said, uh, be a doctor. That's natural. That every mother wants their son to be a doctor. And I, I hate that. I, I never enjoyed science. And I said, Mom, I like to write. This is what I want to do. And she said, well, you won't make any money. I said, I would rather be happy in what I'm doing and not make the money than make the money just to appease your family to appease your mother and father or to appease your new family. You don't have to stay within one department to learn what that department purports to teach. In other words, there's um, a spattering throughout the whole university that um, 
you could, you know, like take things from every single department and come up with a much more interesting, dep what you could call your own department, you know, which would be just as unified in a way because it's um, your concept. I would think that you have to know a, a little bit about a lot of things to deal with uh, society at large. Um, you have to be able to work within those institutions that society has set up already and to somehow manipulate them to your ends, which is really what everybody's out trying to do out there, no matter what name you give it. I have to say that liberal arts education does provide me the opportunity to uh, make many more choices in the scope and range of courses that I would be taking, and so I do think that it is functional in that way. It makes you better around a person, you know, more able to deal with other people, but not necessarily for practical or, you know, something applicable. I'd say uh, take all the Austin A courses you can, but uh, after two years, that's enough. I mean, you only get so much general knowledge, and still, once you go to the business school, you can take, you know, a lot of hours of Austin A if you still want it. Unfortunately, I'm not judged as an individual. I have to compete with everybody else. If I could, I would, but I can't. I mean, they're looking at me, they're not saying, how many books did you read? They want to know what kind of grades you have, or how many kind of test scores. That's just the way the system is, and I can't beat it. school is, it's kind of loud, loud in here, but all I think of dental school is you're going to be a dentist and you forget the rest of your life, you know, like I'm skipping classes right now to be here, but I have to figure out which classes I can skip so that I can, you know, live to, you know, enjoy myself, so, you know, dental school is narrow-minded, yeah, you know, it is. Allison A gives you a chance to take a lot of science classes, a lot of language classes, you can take art classes, you can just round out your background, and People are losing sight of this, I think, because people just say, well, I have to go and become something and get out of school. They're losing sight of an education, which should be to expand your, your outlook on the world, you know? Can you see you lift weights? Oh, God. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you lifting here? faculty member. A faculty member. Okay. Do you have any advice for the students that you sometimes teach that you would like to offer to them as incoming people? Uh, know what you want. Don't take the competition too seriously. Make up your own mind what your goals are. Do your students often come to see you in your office for personal interviews? Yeah. And how do you feel about that? Oh, I enjoy talking to them. I learn a lot from them. I have to say that it has not been until this, my junior year, which I have finally um, come to some sort of method of choosing a course which I will somehow give me what I want out of it. And I realize now that whereas I used to pick the courses by the subject matter, I now pick them by the professor because it's the only way that I can ensure that the kind of issues that I am concerned about will be dealt with in my education. I'm committing with my uh, new strategy, I have found also that there has been with that more, definitely more contact with the professor and using this approach I feel much more comfortable going up to a professor and saying sort of, hey, what are you all about and what kind of uh, you know, topics are you going to deal with in the class and how are you going to deal with them. And um, I, I guess I, I've done that now with a couple of my professors who, who um, I'm trying to approach on this more personal level. And, it has the potential to be much more fulfilling and rewarding, that kind of personal contact, which I've really lacked. Well, I think it's a requirement of freshman uh, comp to have meetings periodically with the teacher. We had about four meetings about every two or three weeks. One time I, um, you know, I wrote it the night before, and it was so bad that I was embarrassed to hand it in. So I told him, you know, I'm really embarrassed of this paper. I can't hand it in like this. And, you know, is it okay if I hand it in the next class period? And he said, fine. Because he really wanted to see, you know, my writing improve. He was a really nice guy. He, he took a genuine interest. You know, that's just one thing. To get the professor to know you personally and to keep that personal slant rather, rather than just being another, another uh, thing. Cause Talk to professors if you're interested. Talk to some counselors, but there you have to be careful. My experience with counselors has not been that great. Well, I've had three different counselors four different counselors since I've been here. I'm in the Honors College, so I have to have an Honors Counselor. They assign people according to what they say they're interested in in their freshman year, so I started out with one who was a German counselor, and I didn't 
especially like her or, or develop much of a, an ease with her. So I looked around for someone else and I happened to live in Alice Lloyd, so I used the pilot program honors counselor for the rest of the year, who was great, but then he took a job somewhere else. For a while I saw Dr. Graf, who's the head of honors, who's a really fine counselor, but not really in my department, so then eventually I had a history of art counselor who's, who's great, and I see him all the time. I run into him everywhere, and I can stop by and talk to him whenever I want to. When I came during the summer, I met with a counselor that was, by chance I met with him, and the same counselor was recommended to me by a sophomore, a friend of mine that goes here. And so he has pretty much been, been like my surviving thing, because I can go and talk to him, I, I can get along with him, and, and we almost like, he almost knows me by name, which I find unusual, because he must see, you know, 40,000 people. Counseling for scholastic problems and counseling for personal, and it's it's relevant in that it helps you to be able to study if you have if you can go to something like that instead of whacking out in your own apartment. Or you can go like there's a lot of people on campus. Even if you go talk to your professors, they'll help. People just don't realize it though. You have to go and talk to them. You have to meet them, or you have to take at least one class under them. Professors don't really pop out at you. The one, of course, it's. A value to be in a university situation. I couldn't have gotten my education all by myself because you need the input and the stimulus of other people who are interested in maybe the same thing as you are, who have other leads, who can show you other things, other places to go to, other resources, turn you on to new people, turn you on to new reading that you would never have been able to come up with by yourself. There's too much information out there. You know, you, you can't come up with it all yourself unless you read 24 hours a day. Jobs are becoming less certain. If you're, if you're not into a profession or you're not into a vocation, you have to use a little bit of um, originality in the way you approach how you're going to make money when you come out of school. And if you're in just a specialized department, you're going to be like dimes, a dime a dozen. You're going to all look and be alike and act alike and not you know, literally, but as far as employers are concerned or whatever, or if you're going to be self-employed. If your knowledge of, of what you're going to be using in the outside world is going to have to be self-defined. It's going to have to be your choice of what you wanted to learn. Education has to be more self-shaped as outside things become more self-shaped, you know, like you're not going to have necessarily a career that you're going to stay in one job for the rest of your life, you know, like it, unless you get into business, you know, and fine, you know, get into business and do a departmental job, but if you want something a little more original, you're going to have to be going at it your own way, and so your education has to be the same. Well, I'm actually a mathematics major, <laughs> uh, but I, I do take a lot of liberal arts course, uh, like sociology, psychology. Yeah, I, I think it does. I, uh, I think it, it's, it's enabled me to, to steer a, a middle path between technology and humanism. If you go in the grocery store and there's a bunch of tomatoes that are all packaged together and you don't like one of them, um, well, you should take, take out the other bunch of them. It's just like that with the concentration program. If I took all the courses they wanted me to take, I'd be, um, I, I would probably not feel as good about um, what I've done here as unpackaging them and choosing them, re choosing them myself.